Okay, so, so what are the relevance judgments? Uh, this is basically what decides uh, which documents are relevant, which are not. Uh, relevance judgments are usually binary, so either relevant or non-relevant. Um, sometimes you have graded judgments, so where documents are ranked on a scale, say from one to five, something like that. Um, uh, there is uh, there is actually there is there is a lot of problems with graded judgments. So um, they are they are more expensive to obtain. Uh, the agreement between the users is lower if you use graded judgments. It's higher if you just force them to decide relevant, non-relevant. Uh, the cognitive load for the users is a little bit higher for graded judgments, so they are slower at producing graded judgments, so you can get more binary judgments in a unit of time than you can get graded ones. And with graded judgments, uh, it's also harder to build metrics. So most of the metrics that we're going to be talking about use binary judgments, relevant, non-relevant. Um, how are they produced? They're basically produced by having multiple annotators look at the same set of documents. The reason this is done is to reduce the mistakes from any individual annotator, right? So I run the query pet therapy, I get some documents, and I think that some documents are relevant and some are non-relevant. You run pet therapy, your decisions might be a little bit different. So what you do is you have, I produce my set of judgments, you produce your set of judgments, and then there is a round of, um, uh, th then there is a round where we look at the cases where we differed, right? So the documents that I thought were relevant and you thought were irrelevant, we try to come to a consensus, right? We try to decide are they really relevant or not. So uh, <clears throat> you do this basically to, uh, to, to, to reduce the accidental mistakes that are due to each individual user. You try to come up with an objective notion of what is and what is not uh, relevant to the query. And then, of course, you have, you have lots of issues. As soon as you have more than, more than one annotator, you have to do all kinds of uh, look at, look at intra-annotator agreement and things like that. <clears throat> okay, so how do you come up with relevance judgments? Uh, that's, a, that's a tricky one. Now, um, in, the, in the early days, when the corpora were small and you didn't have very many queries and, uh, and, uh, and graduate students were cheap, uh, you could do exhaustive annotations. So uh, what are exhaustive annotations? Basically, you could, uh, that's where you take a query, and for every document that's in your corpus, you make a decision. Is that relevant or is that not relevant to your uh, query? So it's feasible if you have 3,000 documents in your corpus and if you have uh, 30 queries. You know, it'll, it'll take a couple of person years, but that's OK. Right? Uh, uh, it is not feasible on, on data sets uh, that we work with uh, now, right? So if you have a data set which is sort of a billion documents and maybe uh, a few hundred queries, uh, there is no way you can label every document as relevant or not relevant for every query. It does get done occasionally when you have a new task. So um, when, when somebody invents uh, a new problem, sometimes they create exhaustive judgments. Uh, but... but <clears throat> It's quite rare. Um, so um, now, before we talk about how you, uh, what you actually label, uh, so uh, let's look at a question. Well, why, why, why don't you just label the top? Uh, why don't you just label the top ten? So think about think about what the search engine produces. Your search engine uh, ranks the data set, right, and. Um, uh, and gives the first page as the result to the user. Now, most of the users will never go beyond the first page of the results, right? So why don't we just label the first page of results to see uh, what, what percentage of relevant stuff uh, is in there? And, um, and, there, and there's, a problem. there's lots of problems with that. Um, it would work for the web. It doesn't work very well for professional searchers. So uh, professional searchers tend to want recall, and for them, just looking at the top 10 is not enough. They, they really, so people like lawyers, they like to make sure that they have every example that is potentially relevant to their case, even if it means that they have to look at 100 pages. Right. <clears throat> Another issue with that is if you just run a search engine and then you label the top 10 results for each query, uh, that biases your relevance judgments very significantly towards the engine that you've run. Right? So, um, and, and, and what that means is that your, the, 
the judgments that you produce, they will not be a good set of judgments for anyone else's algorithm, as long as their algorithm is even slightly different from yours. So um, I guess a good example is of, uh, you know, if, uh, if I am, say, hell-bent on trying to prove that a certain linguistic technique works very well for information retrieval, I could build a search engine based on, you know, based on parsing the documents and trying to infer the meaning, and I could label the top 10 documents as relevant or non-relevant, and I could release that as a set of uh, relevance judgments for everyone else to use. Right? And of course, um, if I do that, then an interesting thing is going to happen. The judgments are biased towards my top 10. That means that any relevant documents that are not in my top 10 would not be labeled. So any system that retrieves those relevant documents would not get the credit for retrieving them. Right? So that's a quick way to, uh, to create cheating relevance judgments that favor your system if you can convince other people to use uh, the same relevance judgments that you've created. So, so, there's, a, so there's, there's actually a big problem with that. Right. Now, how do, you do, uh, how do you actually do the labeling? Which documents do, do you label? So we said that you cannot, you cannot do the top 10. Uh, that would bias it towards one particular system. You cannot do it exhaustively. It's too expensive. So what do you do? Uh, and the basic solution is sample, sampling. You sample in various ways. So uh, track has a, a certain procedure for sampling, and that's, that's become quite popular. They've, they've debugged it over the years. Uh, the way it basically works is uh, they have a number of participating systems. Say you have 30 systems competing in a certain task. So what they do is they, um, they have each system run on a corpus. Each system retrieves a set of documents. They take uh, top K documents from every system. So And K varies. You know, it could be top 50 or top 200, something like that. Uh, you repeat that over the 30 systems, then you dump everything into one big pool. So you dump those 30 sets of 50 documents into one pool. Uh, you remove the duplicates. Hopefully, there's a lot of document duplicates because uh, systems will agree on what documents are in the top 50. Uh, and then you randomize them and present those to the annotators. So basically what you're doing is you are taking top K documents, but you're trying to you're trying to spread it across a variety of different systems. And uh, the reason people trust this is as soon as you have a large number of participants, each participant's system has different strengths and, we and weaknesses, right? So it's highly unlikely that any relevant documents will be missed by all 30 participants. Any individual participant will miss lots of them, but, as, but all 30 of them tend to get a pretty good job. So that's, what, that's what's known as uh, pooled uh, sampling. Um, so that's one way to come up with the relevance judgments. Uh, once you have this pool, you have your team of annotators. You assign documents to annotators randomly, and you make sure that every document is looked at by at least a couple of annotators so you can measure agreement and you can resolve uh, disagreements, cases where one thinks it's relevant and another thinks uh, it's not relevant. So that's, that's pooled annotation. Um, another, another way you can do this is you can do search-guided annotation. So the idea there is you have a single system and you have a single um, annotator. And what they do is they run the query, they get the ranking, and they keep reading the ranked list, doing judgments, relevant, non-relevant, relevant, non-relevant, non -relevant, until they are subjectively convinced that there is not going to be any more relevant documents in this ranking. Of course, you can never be sure that there is no more relevant documents, but the judgment that you make is, you know, as soon as you see, okay, it's going to take me another 10 pages to find another relevant document, then you give up and uh, move on to the next step. And the next step is you reformulate the query using what you've learned about the documents that you've seen. You get another ranking and you repeat the process. And with some luck, a lot of the documents that you found in the first phase You'll also find them in the second phase, but you will hopefully find some other documents that you haven't seen. And by the way, if you do that, you can actually exclude the documents that you've marked in the first phase because you don't need to look at them uh, the second time. So this is, uh, this is search-guided annotation. This is basically getting the user to interactively uh, expand upon, uh, upon the stuff that he's looking at. Yeah. Would we expand if they use the same <coughs> Yes. So in this, so the question was, uh, are, 
they're, they're reformulating the query, but is, is the information need the same? Yes, the information need stays the same. So the definition of what's relevant and what's not relevant doesn't change. Uh, otherwise, otherwise this, wouldn't, uh, this wouldn't work. So you keep the same definition of what's relevant, and you just try to reformulate the query to find the parts that you missed. <clears throat> um, 